It's chapter 20, and if this was a romantic comedy, this is where the story would end. But in case you haven't figured it out yet, it is not a romantic comedy. Welcome to Chapter by Chapter. Between the boat trip and chapter 19, and the start of chapter 20, a full year passes. And this time, Tommy undergoes his third round of donations. And by the end of this year, Kathy fulfills what she believes to be Ruth's dying wish. She becomes Tommy's carer. Tommy's reward for making it past three donations is a room to himself. But as Kathy explains, this is little more than an upgraded prison cell. She tells us, It wasn't that great a room. I think it had been a bathroom back in the holiday camp days, because the only window had frosted glass and was really high up near the ceiling. You could only look out by standing on a chair and holding open the pane, and then you only got a view down onto the dense shrubbery. Now you'll notice that Kathy never calls this room a prison cell. I do that. In fact, the very next paragraph, she backtracks from her mild criticism, saying, I don't want to give the wrong idea about that period at the Kingsfield. A lot of it was really relaxed, almost idyllic. And I think what Kathy just said there also helps show us what must be one of the traits that makes her such an effective carer. She never questions the system too harshly. But this also makes her an interesting slash infuriating narrator. We'll talk more about Ishiguru's motivation for Kathy's specificity, but for now, it's worth noting that this by-the-book mindset is about to be challenged. For Ruth's wish wasn't just for Kathy and Tommy to be together, it was for them to take a chance at deferrals. But perhaps I'm judging Kathy's lack of judgment too harshly, because she goes on to explain just why her time at Kingsfield is so precious to her. My usual time to arrive was after lunch and I'd come up to find Tommy stretched out on the narrow bed, always fully clothed, because he didn't want to be like a patient. I'd sit in the chair and read to him from various paperbacks I'd bring in, stuff like The Odyssey or One Thousand and One Nights. Otherwise, we'd just talk, sometimes about the old days, sometimes about other things. He'd often doze off in the late afternoon when I'd catch up on my reports over at his school desk. It was amazing, really the way the years seemed to melt away, and we were so easy with each other. As the chapter goes on, we see that Tommy and Kathy's relationship continues to develop, much in the same way that most serious, intimate relationships develop eventually. What's different for this couple, though, is they have two serious shadows hanging over them. The first is Tommy's donations. The second is Madame. Not only do Tommy and Kathy have to navigate their love for each other, they have to prove to this one woman who used to show up at their boarding school and take their art projects that they're actually in love. Still, Ishiguro has seemingly given the reader a reprieve. He's followed the heartbreak of Ruth's death in chapter 19, with the excitement of Kathy and Tommy finally being a couple in 20, something most readers have been pulling for for some time. But the high is short-lived. Even in the throes of ecstasy, Kathy can't stop seeing a melancholy underlying Tommy's expression, something she reads as on 239. What I mean is, right from that first time, there was something in Tommy's manner that was tinged with sadness that seemed to say, yes, we're doing this now, and I'm glad we're doing it now, but what a pity we left it so late. And try as they might, they can never shake the feeling, that foreboding feeling of dread and death. All they can do is hold on to each other a little tighter. In the middle section of the chapter, Kathy and Tommy start planning how to approach Madame, but neither of them just comes out with a plan outward. In fact, for a while, they don't mention her at all. But one day, Tommy changes that, because he shows Kathy his drawings. Kathy explains the twofold significance of this on 241. I realized immediately this was Tommy's way of putting behind us everything that had happened around his drawings back at the cottages. She goes on to say, He was telling me he wasn't complacent, that he was busy getting on with his part of the preparations. 
Obviously, this is a huge milestone for the relationship, and as Kathy says, they settle into each other's company. But that foreboding feeling continues to linger. Kathy harbors uncertainty about their quest for a deferral. At different parts of the chapter, she describes their plan as embarrassing and reprehensible, and it's no wonder they'd be nervous to rock the boat. They're together and happy, but Tommy is getting stronger, and that means a fourth donation will soon be required. In the final section of the chapter, we learn that Kathy has not only been working as a carer for multiple patients, but also trying to track down Madame. Eventually, her persistence pays off, and she confirms that the enigmatic, gray-suited woman lives at the very address that Ruth passed along to them. We also learn, from Tommy's concern, that going places you've not been assigned to go is risky. But Kathy has been careful, and at the end of the chapter, she and Tommy are resolved. They're going to go speak to Madame. One more interesting thing I wanted to talk about in this chapter, but I didn't want to talk about it earlier because I thought it was a, too much of a diversion, but now I'll bring it up, is the books that the characters read. It's always interesting to think what books are characters in a book reading about. And in this chapter, we see that Kathy is reading two books to Tommy, The Odyssey and 1001 Nights. Now, I might be reading a little bit too much into this, but I think those are two particularly interesting books when you consider the parallels between the characters in them and what's going on with Tommy and Kathy. What I mean by this is both books follow characters who are trying to survive. And more than just survive, I guess they're almost even trying to thrive beyond just settling what fate has dealt them, whether it be getting home or continuing to tell stories so they're not executed. Kathy and Tommy, likewise, are in this quest for survival. And the interesting thing about the characters in these epics is that they don't survive through strength or rebellion in the usual sense. They survive through cunning. Scheherazade stays alive through storytelling, and Odysseus continually survives through being a trickster. And this, I think, really plays into Tommy and Kathy, who are attempting survival, uh, not through force, not through rebellion, but through love, and also cunning, being able to track down Madame um, and trust Ruth. And that's what these three characters even after Ruth's death, they have stuck together and continued to, taking, continued to take care of one another. So anyway, thank you so much for watching this video and um, sticking around for my rambling about those books. Like I said, I just thought that was kind of interesting. Best of luck as you finish up the novel. We're only a few chapters out, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. See you next time.